What up, what up? Salvador Brigman here. Welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified podcast. On this show, we cover the crowdfunding industry and more specifically, what goes into a successful crowdfunding campaign, kind of the engine behind it, the mechanics that go into a successful launch, kind of pulling back the curtain and showing you exactly what's happening behind these incredibly successful crowdfunding campaigns, which you come across, which you might stumble upon, which you might hear about in the news. We get into it, we dissect it, we de demystify it for you in my kind of hallmark fashion. And I've been doing this uh, in terms of the industry since 2012. I'm doing this podcast since 2015, and it is literally one of my best, my favorite passions that I have in my life is to bring this kind of valuable education to you because you can then take it and you can run with it, right? You can achieve things. You can grow a brand from scratch. You can make an impact on the universe. You can bring a new product into the world that delights people all over the globe. It's so freaking exciting, and I think it's just an incredible amount of leverage as well. Uh, so I try to bring on real world entrepreneurs, creators, artists, people that are actually doing it, that are in the trenches, and they share with you exactly what they do in order to get funding, to get backers, and to really knock it out of the park when it comes to their crowdfunding campaign. So today's podcast episode is no exception to that rule, the golden standard, which we have when it comes to my website, CrowdCrux. Um, so today we actually brought on a guest, uh, an individual, an entrepreneur. He doesn't even call himself an entrepreneur. He, he is an entrepreneur. He's an innovator. You know, he's a he's an inventor. But um, this man has raised over $300,000 with his most recent campaign, having attracted over 11,000 backers uh, for this most recent campaign for the Forever Sponge. But in addition, they as a team have launched multiple Kickstarter campaigns. I'm talking about creating six campaigns over a span of time. Even their first project had 5,000 backers for Grill Rescue. So you're not only going to hear from someone who's done, done it once, they have done it multiple times. And today they're sharing with you their secret sauce. They're getting into the science behind how to actually launch a successful crowdfunding campaign using the Kickstarter platform. So if you're looking to get funding for a project, you're looking to bring something new into the world to create a product of some kind to start a brand from scratch. Um, you're going to get everything when it comes to what went into this successful raise. Now, before we get into this podcast episode, I do have two quick things to mention. The first is that for those of you that really want to figure this out, right? You don't want to have to go and hunt around for information, try to figure this out and put together different pieces of the puzzle. I really just want it laid out simply. I have an incredible free course out there that I put together just for you called my free Kickstarter course. So for anyone out there who wants to raise funding, whether it's on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, go and check out my free Kickstarter course. All you got to do is enter your name and email. You'll start getting some lessons from me emailed to you. And you can go through that course and start to get up to speed with how to actually do one of these campaigns, but also some of the tricks of the trade, some of the magic that goes into how to actually raise funds quickly right? How do you surpass your goal fast? How do you actually market and promote this project and this campaign, even if you have a small following? And uh, you can go and check out that link at crowdcrux.com slash Kickstarter. That link is C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash Kickstarter. Again, that link is crowdcrux.com slash Kickstarter. The other uh, resource that I have to share with you today is kind of because, you know, when I got into this industry, again, I really wanted to pioneer something great. I want to create different pillars that were going to help you when it comes to raising funding from the crowd. And what I quickly realized is that there was no textbook on this sucker. So I set out to actually figure that out for you. I went through so much intensive work in studying what works, working with many different clients, helping people with their campaigns, you know, coaching, etc. And I pulled everything apart and I actually assembled a formula that you can follow in order to be successful with a Kickstarter campaign. And I put this all into my book, the Kickstarter launch formula. So if you're kind of one of those people who really just wants to it's like, hey, Sal, just tell me exactly what I got to do. And you want to follow it. You want the blueprint behind this. Just go and grab a copy of the Kickstarter launch formula. It's available as a paperback version on Audible, uh, sorry, on, on Amazon. It's available as an ebook as well on Amazon. And finally, I have an Audible version where I read it with my passion, with my enthusiasm. I get you ramped up. I get 
get you excited about this project and also share with you incredibly valuable resources, tactics, tools, and techniques that go behind a powerful campaign launch. So if you want to check that out, go and check that out at crowdcrux.com slash kickstarter audio. That link is crowdcrux.com slash kickstarter audio. Again, that link is crowdcrux.com slash kickstarter audio. And remember, whatever you're trying to achieve in life, you're only as good as those tools which you have access to. And the Kickstarter launch formula is certainly one of the tools that you want to have in your war chest when you are going into battle. And also, great, man, dude, Audible is still doing this incredible promo where you, if you actually sign up for a free 30-day trial of Audible, you can also get a free copy of the Kickstarter launch formula, which is kind of like a nice bonus, right? That being said, uh, let's dive into this particular podcast episode and let's get in how to how this entrepreneur, how this individual was able to raise over 11, uh, to attract more than 11,000 backers and raise over 300K with their Kickstarter campaign. It's coming up right after this. Hey guys, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. Today we are speaking with a creator who's been able to attract more than 11,000 backers for his campaign, having raised over 300,000. And not only that, but he is a Kickstarter veteran. He is in the Hall of Fame. We're talking about the co-creator of Forever Sponge. We are lucky enough to have him on the show. Anthony, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Definitely, man. Um, you know, let's get started. Maybe you can kind of fill some gaps in when it comes to that introduction. And you can tell listeners a bit about your your story when it comes to Kickstarter and your experience there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, our first project was called Grill Rescue. And that's kind of our hero product still to date. That was our first Kickstarter campaign in 2019. So um, we didn't really know what we were doing so much then. I had a few few successful Kickstarters with some other businesses, a few failed Kickstarters with some other businesses, but not really in the same region as, as with, with grill rescue, this business. Um, we did a little over a little over 200,000 in sales on that Kickstarter campaign. Um, few thousand backers and, uh, it was, it was good, but was it an anomaly? We didn't know. So you know, four or five campaigns later, it doesn't seem like it was. We kind of did figure out some of that magic in Kickstarter. Now, granted, we're not the largest creator on Kickstarter, but we're not the smallest. We're kind of right there in the sweet spot. But um, we've definitely learned a lot over the years. And I feel like even with this last campaign, we still continue to learn. Awesome. And what are you passionate about? Do you say you're an inventor? Are you a entrepreneur? Are you a marketer? Like, how do you identify it's a great question. Um, it's funny. Whenever my wife introduces me to people, she calls me an inventor, but the word always seems to rub me the wrong way for some reason. Um, mm. I guess entrepreneur is kind of uh, also a big fluff word now that I think maybe early on I was comfortable with, but now I'm not so much. But honestly, I, I whatever the title is, I am super passionate about marketing. I love advertising. Um, I love sales. So really sales and marketing is is my sweet spot. So regardless of what you want to call me, I do invent products. I do love marketing. Um, and I can, I'm can i comfortable to say I can add crowdfunding into that mix. One, one of the cool things I think about, you know, looking at some of the projects you've been successful with is you're good at identifying a problem and creating like a really unique solution to that. Um, and I know that kind of spills over into your current campaign. So maybe you could tell listeners just like a tiny bit about Forever Sponge and where did that idea come from? Where did that inspiration come from? Absolutely. So the idea, um, the idea came from just, I think with anything, like you said, there's a problem, right? Wanting something better. So there's been a lot of sponges on the market over the last hundreds of years, and they've all kind of been exactly the same. I think the only anomaly that we've seen in the sponge market, if that, if you can even call it that, is um, probably Scrub Daddy. They're, in my eyes, the first people to kind of make a innovative sponge. Um, but there's still a lot of flaws with that, right? Um, it, it lasts maybe a little bit longer than your flimsy sponge that you've been using forever, that green and yellow or the all blue sponge that most people are used to. Um, it was definitely a better solution to that, but they still wear out pretty fast. Uh, you can still slice them with your sharpest knife. We I've always noticed that I've been cleaning my knives uh, backwards on purpose because you don't want to slice through your hand. And I don't feel like that mm -hmm. should be a problem that you should really have to deal with, right? You should be able to clean whatever you want, however you want to do it. And I think there's a lot of issues with um, 
bacteria, they get moldy. Um, sponges have just been the same way for so they long. They kind of suck. They kind of yeah. suck. And no one's really done anything about it. So there, it seemed to be this wide opportunity that nobody's taken. Um, and I just felt the need to jump on it. Now, I'm sure a guy like you has like hundreds of ideas, right? And just like coming at you all the time. Um, what really stands out about one that you're going to seriously take action on? Like, do you start to then kind of work it out with the prototype or do you just kind of think through the market? Like, what's your process in really deciding, hey, I want to focus on this sucker? Well, it's interesting. So Kickstarter has kind of been our platform to gauge, uh, is this product even viable? So what we've done is uh, anytime I had an idea starting from the very first product, I'll make a pretty terrible prototype and just enough for it to work. So when we first launched Grill Rescue, it was a handle from another grill brush. It was a block of wood wrapped with a towel, and it was just enough to <laughs> the concept on paper and and actually a, a working in quotes prototype. Um, and that was enough to launch on Kickstarter. And then we learned about three D printing, and you know these are all things that I didn't know in two thousand nineteen. So mm-hmm. now I kind of refine that process where if we have an idea we'll shoot it out to our selective group, uh, a small audience. We have a Facebook group of maybe like 10,000 people and we might shoot it out there saying, Hey, what do you guys think about this idea? So they can give us some initial feedback. Once I have that and and it's a good idea and and I love the idea, then we can take it to Kickstarter and do a preliminary campaign there. So we'll do a little bit of pre um, pre pre-marketing. We'll throw out the idea. Okay. Our Facebook group liked it. Now we have X amount of signups to be notified when the campaign launches. That's a good sign. Now we should absolutely, you know, put all our eggs in this basket and run with it. So Kickstarter is really to tell us, does the market like this? Will enough people back this project? People believe in it. So if we actually take it to market, this thing will sell. Um, It's pretty expensive to even take a campaign to Kickstarter, but it's, it's very expensive to launch a product and start running ads on it if no one really likes it. So, so when, before we get into some of my questions, um, why is it that everyone in the United States needs this sponge? Like, what, what is so gosh darn special about it? What's unique about the Forever Sponge? I would say there's there's a few really big things that a few really big reasons why you might need Forever Sponge. Um, one, if you're tired of throwing out your sponge every week, this is just seems like the obvious solution. Um, the other is if you align with the problem where you know you're cleaning your knives upside down on purpose because you don't want to cut yourself. If you find yourself throwing your sponge in the microwave to try to microwave out the bacteria that's been in there because you don't want to throw it out every week, it's just, you know, if you want to just have a cleanlier household, a sponge that actually looks good, it's it's visibly appealing. Um, I think those are some really good reasons why you might want the sponge. Out of curiosity, back in 2019, before you started launching your own projects uh, with your partners, you know, what were you doing? Um, what was like your nine to five job or what kind of career were you in? So I had other businesses by that time. Um, I did a lot in the online space. So a lot of online services. I would help people start their companies um, from very basic things like helping them get EIN numbers and state resale certificates. Um, I had another business where I would help people uh, get different licenses from the government. So whether it's a concealed weapons license, a fishing and hunting license, just different online services to make their life easy with dealing with the government. And that was kind of the realm that I was in for a while. And what made you like even consider or what kind of pushed you over the edge with wanting to do your own product? Because I think that's that's kind of different, right? Than uh, what you were doing before. Yeah, it's very different. I guess I'll kind of pose that into a question for you. Have you ever tried dealing with the government? (laughs) My man, it's like, yeah, it's pulling teeth, takes forever. It's like, you know, glaciers, right? Uh, Slow moving. Yeah. So imagine doing that every single day, day after day, it it wears you down. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it was time to do something different. And I had the idea for grill rescue for years before we ever launched it on Kickstarter. It was just kind of a project for me. Uh, I wanted a better grill brush. I had heard about all the issues of the metal bristles falling off and landing in your food. And I was using at the time a, like a, a stone, like a grill stone cleaner. And it just left Mm-hmm. outer all over the grates but you know what it was better than the bristles it was better than anything else that existed but it uh it was time to get something that that was better and i had this idea and like i said the the handle with the block of wood that's kind of what i created and i sat on that for two or three years 
And I was just using it for myself until my business partner said, Hey, we should probably introduce this to the world. I think it's a great idea. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And sometimes it's all you need is like that, that right kind of encouragement or push or and that's been obviously been a, a huge decision, right? For you. I mean, looking at your campaign now, like you guys got a heck of a lot of backers, like 11,000 people, people can kind of look at that and like, wow, this is like untouchable. Right. Um, just to kind of, you know, bring, it to reality what were some of the thoughts or what were some of the feelings that were kind of going through your head before you launched this were you still feeling that kind of like fear or uncertainty like what were you feeling before you went live with this it doesn't matter how good my idea is i constantly feel fear and uncertainty uh, minutes and hours before i click that launch now button on kickstarter no matter how many projects i i do no matter how successful they are i always think are people actually going to like this Um, is this going to be a total failure and embarrassment? I think that up until the second I hit launch. And then you hit that button and you go live and you start to see, you know, the numbers ticking up, you start to get some funding after the first week, um, what's kind of going through your mind? Yeah. I I think after the first hour, once I see the, the ticker, you know, dialing up, it's like, okay, this is a great idea. I don't know what I was afraid of. People really like this and all that hard work and dedication that I put into it and all the um, all the work that my team put into this is was worth it. And it kind of is reassuring to know that, you know, all that self-doubt is kind of for no reason. And it's, you know, it was a good idea. And then fast forward a week, fast forward to the end of the campaign, you know, when you have numbers like 11,000 backers, that's, first of all, it's 11,000 backers, but we're talking 40, 50,000 uh, products ordered for something that's not even created. These people believe in you that much to pre-order your product, sometimes six months in advance. Um, It's a pretty good feeling. Now, I know there's a lot of advice out there. You can go on Google and you can go search. Um, You know, from your own experience and kind of figuring out a little bit of the magic of how Kickstarter works, what would you tell a beginner? Someone who's kind of in that same seat as you, maybe has has another business or trying to get into this. Um, What do you feel like has worked well for you when it comes to the platform? So I think a lot of... um, a lot of things that people don't think about are what, what effort goes into actually promoting a Kickstarter. And I think from public facing, it seems like you have a great idea, you put it on Kickstarter, and it's just going to work. And that simply hasn't been the case, at least for me. I won't speak for any other projects that I haven't ran. But anytime I have had a successful Kickstarter, there is a lot of money that's involved. You have to spend on advertising. There's a lot of hidden costs that I think a lot of people don't realize. So just publishing a product, whether it's good or bad, isn't necessarily going to just skyrocket. You could have an amazing idea and put no funding behind it. And I think the the odds of it working are still pretty low. In the early stages of Kickstarter, I'm sure that was the case, but I'm thinking now probably not so much. And you might know more than me because you talk to a lot more creators than I do. But um, there's a lot of effort that goes in the back end and a lot of dollars spent in order to get attention on these Kickstarter campaigns. And I think that's something to be aware of before you even start a campaign. So making sure you can get things like a professional video, you can invest in advertising, right? You can actually put some budget behind the campaign. It sounds like that's that's essential, right? Yeah, yeah. I skipped over a lot of those those points that you made, I think, because I, I don't think about it that regularly. But yeah, absolutely. You know, if you have a terrible video or I see a lot of these campaigns with just slideshows and pictures with a voiceover, not the way to go. Um, we've been doing professional video since the beginning. And I, I skipped over that point, but absolutely copywriting is important images and uh, gifts on the page are super important. Um, and that's just that's just the base before you even think about pricing and rewards and marketing. And uh, there's there's so much that goes into it. If you're worried about the fulfillment and shipping part of your Kickstarter campaign when it comes to getting out all those perks and rewards to your backers, rest assured I've put together a complete Kickstarter fulfillment and shipping checklist for you, and it's free. This is sponsored by the folks at FulfillRight, and they thought that you should have this checklist as part of your arsenal going into a crowdfunding campaign. If you want to get instant access to this checklist and it's free, you can go to fulfillright.com slash checklist. Again, that is f u l f i l l r i t e dot com slash checklist fulfillright dot com slash checklist. Just go to that link and you can download it immediately. I was looking at some of your other projects, and I mean, your first campaign, the the Grill Rescue, you guys got like five thousand backers. But even so, like this recent campaign, you guys doubled that, right? Why do you feel like this one got so big so fast? 
I think we've learned a lot. Um, another thing that we've never tried before, and I think one of those, those um, another part of that fear and that self-doubt in me was I've never tried a product that was this low priced. Um, it's a very affordable product. Not that our original campaign wasn't, but this was less than half of the cost of our first campaign. So I was worried, are the profit margins going to be there? Will we get the amount of backers that we need for this to be a profitable campaign? Um, so thankfully we, we did, but yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's, I, I don't know that I could pinpoint exactly what it was that got us here, but I think the last four years of learnings definitely contributed to it. In, in having these different learnings and kind of understanding your customer base and, and online marketing, what's one of them that you could share um, with listeners that you feel like would help them, um, you know, bring any kind of product to market or, or launching their campaign? Yeah. In addition to all the points that we just kind of made, I think finding the right advertising partner is very important. If you are familiar with Facebook ads and Google ads on your own, that, that can be great. But partnering with the right agency, someone who's done this hundreds, if not thousands of times before, um, you can lean on them for advice. They just know how to run the campaigns and it's kind of uh, it's mindless for them. Just like at now making after five campaigns, it's almost mindless for me. And I know the steps to take um, that can give you a huge advantage. It sounds to me like finding and connecting with the right people has been an important part of your success, whether it's with your business partner or different partners online. How, how do you go about doing that? Are you just open to it or do these people approach you? Or are you proactive? Like, how do you, how do you wrestle with that? I do a lot of research to find the, the best uh, agency or the best connection. Um, I, there's definitely a lot of people that reach out to you, but it's, it's tough. You know, you get hundreds of emails a day from people who say that they claim to help you, but that's not always the case. Um, so I do a ton of research when people reach out, I'll do research on them. Um, look at other campaigns, see who else is successful, see what agencies and um, other people they're working with. So I would go and look at my favorite projects and see who's doing really well in the same space. You scroll to the bottom of any Kickstarter campaign and you're going to find uh, a list of three to 10 agencies that they've worked with from backer lists to advertising agencies to um, cross promotion type stuff. And then do your research, get on phone calls with these people, spend some time and, and see if you can figure it out. And that's kind of how I, how I began. Very cool. And yeah, I think that anyone honestly can go out there and they can do that and they can invest some time in that. So I appreciate that point. Um, I think one of the like problems that a lot of experts rest wrestle with is just like becoming jaded. Um, what, what do you find passionate or what, what do you really like about the experience of doing a campaign? Is it the seeing the funding come in? Is it shipping out the product? Is it like having the marketing work? Like what do you really enjoy about the process? Watching the funding is always fun. We we do a, um, now that we have an office and we're a little bit more established, we'll do like a launch party. So, you know, we'll get some donuts really early in the morning. We'll all get to work on posting to our own social channels and sending out email blasts and all that. And it's a, it's good morale to watch the numbers go up. But I think what's most important is um, just like the actual creation of the of the product is really exciting to me. And being able to get true and raw feedback, I'll tell you one thing about Kickstarter uh, backers is they are not afraid to tell you their true feelings. And sometimes <laughs> it might seem like a negative, but it's it's really good because now you can input those suggestions into your final product. So what we decided when we first made Forever Sponge is not the same product as now at the end of the 30-day campaign. We've improved so many little features on Forever Sponge that we didn't even think about. So we got a lot of invaluable mm -hmm. feedback from a lot of these backers that you don't know is going to be a thing. So I think that's the most exciting thing is creating the product, getting real feedback in order to improve it. How do you balance that with, you know, have like a listener come like, Anthony, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't want to give away my idea. Like what if someone steals it, right? What happens if people don't like it? Like, what do you say to those kinds of, those kinds of questions? Sure. I think there's a lot of good ideas that go unnoticed. And I think my own product, Grill Rescue, the very first one, would have been another product that that no one ever got to see and use if I had never shared that idea with the world. At first, I wasn't planning on it until my partner, Scott, said, hey, uh, we should share this with the world. And obviously, it's scary at first. But if you never share that idea in the beginning, uh, you'll never really know if it can be a, a valuable thing. And the truth is that I would say nearly 100% of people 
won't actually um, bring your product to life. They're not passionate about your idea. They don't want to invest the time in it just as much as the truth is like, sometimes I don't want to invest the time in it. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of energy and chances are you're going to be the most passionate about your idea than someone else's. So yes, it's possible. Someone could steal your idea. They could do something first with it, but it's very unlikely. And I think the, the risk is so low, but the reward is so high if you do it yourself. Yeah, well said, well said. And I think you're right as well that you know most people, they'll hear an interesting idea and they don't actually take action on it, right? And that's what kind of separates the people who do and the people who just kind of think and dream, right? Agreed, um, yeah. I don't think anyone should be afraid to share their idea for that reason. I get the hesitation, but really nobody's going to do it. What, one other question I had for you was kind of on the, the new stage of Kickstarter that I feel like it's going through as a platform. So with like, like the recent CEO and a lot of the different changes. I was just kind of curious, um, have you noticed any kind of evolution with the platform or the marketplace that you could speak to? I've seen very minimal changes. Again, you might know a little bit more than I do, but um, one of the new features, and uh, it's hardly a huge improvement. I noticed that you're able to put images on your rewards now. That's something that we haven't been able to do even with our most recent campaign. So other than that, I don't know that I've I've noticed a lot. And in terms of the the community itself, do you feel like it's the same size as it was before, or are you still seeing people regularly back your campaign within the community? Yeah, I would say it's pretty even. Again, you might know more than I do, but it seems um, it seems pretty steady. And maybe that's because my campaigns don't have as large of a reach as some of these other board games or larger creators. But uh, to me, we've had campaigns that are high and campaigns that are. Yeah, you know, half the size of these. So I don't know that I've reached a new audience or a different audience. Um, it, it feels pretty similar to me, but I, I could be off on that. Got it. Uh, one one other question I had is a kind of like a, a segue on another topic related to just what kind of happens after Kickstarter, right? So like you ship out all these products and then it sounds like you've really made a, a foray into like selling things online and and having an online store. Um, how does that how does that work compared to doing a Kickstarter campaign? What is that like in, in terms of your business? Sure. So so doing the Kickstarter is one thing. After the Kickstarter is really where the work begins. You have to start manufacturing the product. Uh, naturally, we're at the point now where we've kind of sourced manufacturers before we even launch on Kickstarter, but we didn't have that luxury at first. Now, uh, once the Kickstarter ends, we start to finalize those, review final samples, place our orders. And then it's logistics. It's getting that stuff here and getting it shipped out. And um, there's a lot of work that goes into that. Once we have the product in stock, obviously we order more product than what's required to fulfill the Kickstarter orders because now we need to sell on our website. We need to sell on Amazon and all these other platforms. So I don't know how deep you want to go into this, but there's a there's a lot of work required after the Kickstarter. The Kickstarter almost becomes the easy part once once it's over. Do you, do you feel like people still discover you online um, as a result of the campaign? Like I've noticed uh, more and more creators are doing like this in-demand thing, right? Indiegogo in-demand. Um, do, do you notice that like momentum continuing on? Yeah, very valid point. So we, we've we done in-demand with, I believe, every campaign at this point. So once Kickstarter ends, we move over to Indiegogo in-demand. Uh, we'll have a little link on our Kickstarter that forwards over there. And there is some there is some trickle over. People are looking over Kickstarter, looking at previously backed um, successful projects, and then they will notice it on in-demand. And you can kind of redo all your efforts that you did on Kickstarter once again on Indiegogo. So you can kind of relaunch that campaign on the back of the success of Kickstarter because it pulls over the backer count, it pulls over the dollar count. So when people are on Indiegogo, it almost feels like this campaign is continuing rather than a fresh campaign. Very cool. Very cool. A lot of great tips, man. And, you know, a lot of great advice. And um, I'll also make sure, you know, to include the link to, to your campaign. Um, you know, one kind of question I had for you is more on the beginning, which is, you know, before you were doing this, uh, you're doing a different type of business and you finally decided to take the leap, right? Um, if you were to, you know, look forward what did this really mean to you? Like being able to launch products, being able to bring these into the world. What does that mean to you at the end of the day uh, when it came to your original vision? 
Sure. Yeah. It's, it's huge to have a product that was just an idea and maybe had a, a little drawing on paper to be able to bring that to life and have real people that you've never met. We're not talking, you know, your grandma tells you good job. We're talking people that you don't know, people that you've never met reaching out saying, Hey, I love this product or this product saved my life because I once swallowed a bristle and now I never have to worry about that again. Um, that's huge. That's, that's something that. I think most people don't get to feel. And I think at this point, even though it's only been four short years, sometimes I do take it for granted. Um, and I do need to reflect back on on that. So thank you for asking this question because it is, um, it's very rewarding. You're making an impact. Yeah, yeah. It's, absolutely. You're making an impact and it's, and it's, and people are letting you know that and you can actually feel it. It's not, because sometimes the internet feels so impersonal. So when you do get those personalized emails, people reaching out, it it makes a big difference. Super cool. Super cool. Where can people go to learn more about your campaign and also about some of your other products here? Sure. Yeah. Obviously, you can find us on Kickstarter, our latest project, Forever Sponge, um, and our website, grillrescue.com. You can go to foreversponge.com if you want to check out the sponge. And all our other products are linked for both of those links. You could look at everything. My, my final question for you, and we can end on this note. Um, we could either end with a word of encouragement for those that are just kind of getting started. It could be a quote that you like. It could be a final tip about crowdfunding that you think would be super useful that's just not talked about enough. Uh, anything like that. And we can end on those note, on that note. Sure. I don't know if I have any specific quote, but what I will say is if you are doing something that you're not super passionate about um, and you're not sure what the future holds and it feels scary, Sometimes you just have to take the leap because you don't want to go the next 10, 20, 30 years wondering what if. Um, and I think that's a big thing for me. I, when I had a regular job working somewhere, um, I was afraid to start. And um, there's there's a big backstory there, but basically um, I, I had to go through some tough stuff in order to take the jump in order to actually do this. Um, so you don't want to put yourself in a bad situation, but at the same time, Sometimes there's, you just kind of need that push. So I would say, rather than looking back and regretting not trying it, um, it doesn't matter if you're 20 or if you're 70 years old, I think it's important that you you do it for yourself. I think you owe it to yourself to, to figure out the what if before it's too late. There, there's a quote, I'm not exactly sure who said it, um, that everything you want in life is on the other side of fear, right? Really? It kind of almost is like a, that signal of, oh man, I actually should go for this. And it's kind of hard to, I think, do it though, for sure. Oh, so it's, congratulations it's so on all your success. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Man, congratulations on all your success. Um, I'll be sure to link this up in the show notes. And um, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing some advice and also your message uh, when it comes to that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. Again, my name is Salvador Brigman, and I hope that you found this episode to be worth an investment of your time and that you really enjoyed not only this story, but also the tactics, the techniques, the strategy that went behind this mega raise. Being able to get 1,000 to 11,000 people on your side with a crowdfunding campaign is no small feat. So I hope that you walked away from this episode uh, with some useful tools and some inspiration when it comes to your project. And if you did, we did our work here at Crowd Crux. You know, it's not just me, it's also a team of people that are helping to bring this education to light, helping to bring these podcasts, my YouTube videos, the blog that I have, books that are out there to help you um, on your journey. If you really appreciate our mission, which is to demystify crowdfunding, and you think that this is something that's worthwhile, please let us know by leaving a positive rating and review on iTunes. That way other people know that this episode, that this podcast is worth their time, and it also just kind of helps us uh, when it comes to spreading our message, which is to empower creators to reach their potential so they can smash through their crowdfunding campaign goal. In addition, when I started, you know, get started in this industry, one of the things I really wanted to do was to make myself available because I hated a lot of those experts or gurus or people that are out there that have a lot of knowledge about a subject that we have years and years of experience, but they kind of hide behind this brick wall, right? 
or they're in their ivory tower and they're not ever willing to like share or, or you know talk about what, what actually goes into a successful campaign raise or whatever it is you're trying to achieve so one of the things i decided to do was to make myself available with one-on-one -on -one individual coaching calls where we go in depth into your project from a to z everything that you need to do in order to position your campaign correctly in order to be successful with a crowdfunding campaign launch and that could be at from very early stages just the idea stage i have other students that are in the prototype stage where they're making a product and they want some advice on that. I have more students that are even further along when it comes to launching a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo campaign or maybe even exploring other subjects like equity crowdfunding, et cetera. And I even have students who are gearing up to launch in say two weeks and maybe they talk to me and they make some minor tweaks that allow them to have a much more powerful campaign when they go live. So whichever stage that you're in, if you've done a project before, this is well worth an investment of your time and also an investment when it comes to launching a campaign right and getting it right. So if you want to book an individual one-on-one -on -one coaching call with me, which is an intensive call, you can go into this link I'm about to mention and you can do that. Fill out a little bit of information on this form and we can get that call scheduled ASAP. That link is crowdcrux.com slash coaching. Go to the link I'm about to mention at crowdcrux dot com slash coaching fill out a little bit of information when it comes to what you're trying to achieve tell me more about your project tell me more about you and we can get that call scheduled asap again that coaching call link is crowdcrux.com slash coaching c-r-o-w-d-c-r-u-x.com slash coaching and you can get your call scheduled asap thank you so much man for tuning in to this episode of the show i appreciate you so much I'm looking forward to seeing uh, you know, what you're doing when it comes to your project. Leave a comment on one of my YouTube videos or leave a positive review. We love to read through them and we can uh, make sure next week as well to deliver you literally golden nuggets that go into a campaign launch and some of the tactics and the strategy that I think is actually gonna be um, kind of like almost new. Uh, I don't think there's honestly broken any kind of ground that I wanna share with you next week. So stay tuned for my next episode. Uh, again, this is Salvador Brigman and I will see you next time.